Welcome back, science enthusiasts, to yet another exciting episode of Physics for Students. Today we are about to embark on a journey into one of the most captivating branches of science, thermodynamics. Have you ever marveled at the steam rising from your morning coffee, wondered how engines powered the machines that drive our world, or pondered the mysteries of the universe energy transformations? Well, you are in for a treat because today we are going to demystify the incredible world of thermodynamics. But thermodynamics is not just a scientific concept, it is a story of discovery and innovation. So we will also delve into the evolution of thermodynamics from the early days of steam engines to the groundbreaking work of scientists like Carnot, Clausius and Kelvin. We will tackle one of the most intriguing concepts in thermodynamics, entropy. What is entropy and why does it matter in our everyday lives? You will find out as we explore the concept in depth. So whether you are a seasoned physicist or just a curious mind, this video is for you. We will break down complex ideas into bit-sized, easy to understand pieces. And by the end of this video, you will have a solid grasp of the foundational principles of thermodynamics. My name is Seanak and you are watching this video on my channel, Physics for Students. Welcome to this new episode, Introduction to Thermodynamics, Understanding the Secrets of Heat, Work and Motion. We will go straight into this subject directly and understand what is thermodynamics coming in this part of the video. Well, as we always find the origin of these terms into Greek or Latin, so thermodynamics is basically, you can see this word, which is thermos, the word means heat in Greek, and dynamic, which actually means force or power in Greek. It is related, obviously, to the study of motion and forces. So thermos plus dynamics together make up the work thermodynamics. Uh, we can define it in this way, the study of the relationships between heat, energy, and forces of motion that result result into some form of interactions. Thermodynamics is also a branch of physics and engineering that deals with the study of energy and their interrelationships between work and various physical properties of matter. So obviously, uh, because it is, I have written it in red, interrelationship between heat and work, this is what we are going to, uh, you know, uh, discover and explore a more into this video. But before that, here is a kind of a clear definition of thermodynamics. It is a branch of physics that deals with heat, work and temperature and their relation to energy and entropy. And you can see I have written in red few of the points, four laws of thermodynamics, macroscopic physical quantities, microscopic constituents by statistical mechanics. Now, if we want to take a schematic diagram of this definition, which is right there on your screen, what we get is that is related to heat. It is related to work. It is related to temperature. Now, heat, work and temperature, if you talk as a whole, it would result into something where we have to go back a little bit in the history. So historically, taking heat, work and temperature developed out of a desire to increase the efficiency of this one. Yes, early steam engines, particularly through the work of the French physicist Sadi Carnot, 1824, who believed that engine efficiency was the key that would help France to win the Napoleonic Wars. And he is considered to be the father of thermodynamics. Nicolas Leonard Sadi Carnot, he was a French mechanical engineer in the French army, military scientist as well as a physicist and is, and is described often as the father of thermodynamics. Now, we have to first, uh, before we understand the laws of thermodynamics, etc., we should first understand that why Carnot is cons was considered, is considered to be the father of thermodynamics because he made certain very seminal and important contributions. The first one is called Carnot cycle. If I take a very easy um, description, it tells that it is a theoretical thermodynamic cycle that represents the most efficient way to convert heat into work. Remember that it is a theoretical, but it considers the most efficient way to convert heat into work. It takes actually four processes. One is called isothermal expansion, adiabatic expansion, isothermal compression, and adiabatic compression. Don't worry about these terms. If you don't understand, we will explore up in the 
next part of the video. The second is Carnot efficiency. Now, Carnot efficiency is actually a measure of the maximum possible efficiency uh, for a heat engine operating between two temperature reservoirs. So, there are two temperature reservoirs A and B. What is the maximum measure of the maximum possible efficiency that a heat engine can work out? The third is called Carnot theorem. And this is uh, which uh, something that states that no heat engine operating between two heat reservoirs can be more efficient than a Carnot engine operating between same reservoir. That means it actually sets a fundamental limit in the efficiency of heat engines. Lastly, Carnot heat engine. It is basically an idealized concept of heat engine that operates based on the principles of the Carnot cycle. It is used, uh, you can say, as a theoretical benchmark for the maximum possible efficiency of heat engines. Now, these are the four important ideas and we will explore in today's video that these ideas, how they are taken up by other scientists and has been expanded into the concept of the laws of thermodynamics, uh, I would say entropy and so on. Now, this is actually a very important book written in French. I wouldn't dare to pronounce it in uh, uh, French language, but this is actually the book which tells that it is the founding work of thermodynamics and it contains the preliminary outline which we today call it as the second law of thermodynamics. So, Carnot actually used uh, the concept of caloric. So, it tells that the motive power is due to the fall of caloric from a hot to a cold body which he ana uh, analogized uh, to the work done by water wheel due to the waterfall. Now, this book is in which he expressed the first successful theory of maximum efficiency of heat engines and it actually laid down the foundation principles of the new discipline which we now call it as thermodynamics. If you are interested to read the English version of the book, here it is right on the left hand side of your screen. It is available in Amazon. It is called The Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire, a seminal original work by Sadi Kano which laid the foundation of uh, I would say thermodynamics. Now, as you see, uh, which happens with most of the scientists that the development of these thoughts and ideas really doesn't matter during their lifetime and Carnot was not an exception. Carnot's work actually attracted uh, little attention during his lifetime, but it, actually it was later taken up by Rudolf Cal Clausius. Uh, who actually uh, modified Carnot's uh, cycle and gave much better and a clearer theory and also by Lord Kelvin uh, to formalize the second law of thermodynamics and define the concept of entropy. So, this is, uh, uh, you know, it, it was actually driven by purely technical concerns such as improving the performance and function of the steam engine. Sadi Kano's theoretical work laid an important foundation for modern science as well as technologies such as the automobile and jet engine. So, here you can see in 1848, Lord Kelvin succeeded in obtaining a copy of Carnot's original work and in this paper uh, entitled An Account of Carnot's Theory of the Motive Power, Lord Kelvin further expanded it into different ideas. Now, we have un understood right now a definition of thermodynamics. We have understood who is the father of thermodynamics and certain important concepts and ideas which led to the foundation of formation of the modern thermodynamics. Now, it is the right time that we should go back to the original definition which we started and let us see that where do we stand. So, what we understood is definitely it is a branch of physics uh, is thermodynamics is establishes as a branch of physics emphasizes its role in the scientific study of physical phenomena. It underscores the importance of thermodynamics in explaining and understanding various nat natural processes. Uh, the definition of uh, highlights the core concept that thermodynamic addresses what you can see heat, work and temperature. These are key components in the study and ener uh, uh, of energy and energy transfer. Energy and entropy, obviously this is a very important phenomena because the definition points out the broader implication of thermodynamics such as connection to energy and entropy. Also, it uh, pertains to the physical property of matter and radiation. And the four laws of thermodynamics acknowledges the existence of the four fundamental laws of thermodynamics. These laws are essential principles that underpin the entire field and dictate the behavior of energy and matter in various processes. Statistical mechanics also is very important because it indicates that the comprehensive scope of the field extends beyond just heat and work. 
So taking all these four, uh, I, I would say five things together, we have now got a clear and a better understanding of what is a thermodynamics. But as we know that the entire concept of thermodynamics actually depends on this. What are the four laws of thermodynamics coming up in the next part of the video? Very importantly and uh, something uh, very interesting is that all the laws of physics, quantum mechanics, etc. actually starts with the order of 1, 2 and 3. But for the thermodynamics, we started what is called the zeroth law of thermodynamics coming up in the next part of video. Why it is called a zeroth law, I leave it up to you. If you really know, then you can put it up in the comment section uh, of my video. Now, here it comes, the zeroth law of thermodynamics actually states that if two systems are in thermodynamic equilibrium with a third, the two original systems are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Let us see in terms of a, a quick diagram. So, here is a system A, here is a system B and C. So, what it tells is that if system A is in thermal equilibrium with system C and system B is in thermal equilibrium with system C, then the systems A and B are in thermal equilibrium with each other. So here is the definition if two thermodynamic systems are in both thermal equilibrium with a third system then the two systems are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Now when we are talking of this zeroth law one thing which becomes very very important is uh, what we call is a thermal equilibrium. Now, is it just a mere English statement that uh, it tells that everything is static and nothing is moving is in equilibrium or it carries more significance? Let us look into in the next part of the video where we will try to define clearly what is thermal equilibrium because without defining concepts in physics, this becomes uh, very unclear. So the first thing is that if we take the system systems A, B and C, then we can take the temperature of A is equal to T, B equal to C. I mean to say we can just write it in terms of mathematical equation. So what we see is that a thermodynamic equilibrium is something when there are certain conditions. Number one is that no change in macroscopic properties. That means the values of macroscopic properties such as temperature, pressure, volume and density are constant and do not change over time. Next is no net flow of heat. That means heat does not flow between different parts of the system or between the systems and its surroundings. Third what comes is no net flow of matter. There is no real transfer of matter in or out of the system. There is uniform temperature. The system is at uniform temperature throughout. Uh, that means that there are no temperature gradients within the system. Absence of external influences. The system is isolated from external influences that could perturb, perturb its state such as thermal contact with the heat reservoir. And lastly, equilibrium with its surroundings. The system is in equilibrium with its surroundings, meaning it is not affected by affecting its external environment in a way that would lead to changes in macroscopic properties. Now, these are actually something which makes up the condition or which makes up what is called a thermal equilibrium. But the concept is that thermal equilibrium ha also has got different types of thermal equilibrium. Let us look in the next part of the video. The first is called generally a thermal equilibrium. So, so two systems, I would say, are in thermal equilibrium if they have, you know, the same temperature, something like that. Second is mechanical equilibrium. That means two systems are mechanical equilibrium if the net force on each system is zero. Third one is chemical equilibrium. Two systems are in chemical equilibrium if uh, the rates of forward and reverse actions are equal. And fourth one is radiative equilibrium which states that if they emit and absorb the same amount of radiation. Now, obviously, these things actually have direct uh, life, uh, I would say live examples. Let us look in the next part of the video. So here it is, uh, uh, you know, thermal equilibrium, a hot coffee and a cold table. So a cup of hot coffee eventually reach thermal equilibrium with the table. Mechanical equilibrium with a piston, cylinder and gas. A gas in a cylinder with a piston will eventually reach mechanical equilibrium with the system. Chemical equilibrium is something where uh, there is a beaker and there are certain mixtures of chemicals and you will see that it will eventually reach chemical equilibrium when one, uh, you know, gets mixed up with other. And the uh, last one is what is called a radiative equilibrium. So, it, for example, a star in a space and there are uh, examples like the earth and the sun. This means that the star actually will emit and absorb the same amount of radiation. 
So what we can see from here is this. Thermodynamic equilibrium is a very important concept because it allows us to predict the behavior of system. So if you know that our system is in thermal equilibrium, we can predict that there will be absolutely no transfer heap between the system. Now here is a small thing, as a small kind of a question. If you really know, you can put it up in the comment section of this video that who actually discovered the zeroth law. If you know, please, you are welcome. You can put it up in the comment section on my video. So the zeroth law of the thermodynamics actually establishes a kind of an equilibrium. We have understood what is a thermal equilibrium, different types of thermal equilibrium. We have also seen the example. So after 0 obviously comes 1 and we will now discover the first law of thermodynamics. What is the first law of thermodynamics coming up in the next part of the video? So here is something which I would say a uh, kind of a general example, but I would like to explain a little bit more. So the first law of thermodynamics is actually formulated as a sum of contributions to the internal energy which is U from all work W or uh, which is done or by the system and the amount of heat Q which is being generated. Right. So, as you can see, delta U, which I told you that is the internal energy, is equal to the heat supplied minus the work done. Now, this is the historical convention uh, for the terms that has been used by the heat supplies uh, to the system is positive. So, heat supply to the system is positive, but there is a work done by the system is subtracted. But work done by the, but this was a convention which was used by Rudolf Cassius. So, that a change in the internal energy delta U can take this form. So, we can write it in this way also. And here you can see delta U is actually the total change in internal energy of the system. Q is the heat change between a system and its surroundings. And W is basically work done by the system. So here is a summary of the first law, which tells that um, uh, it is a formulation of the law of conservation of energy in context of thermodynamic processes. So in, uh, in which two principles, forms of energy transfer and heat, heat thermodynamics are distinguished that modify the thermodynamic system of a constant amount of matter. Now, it is also important to know that the first law of thermodynamics which states that the energy can be converted into one form or another, there is also something which is called a work done and which is equal to the negative external pressure on the system applied by the change in volume, which is this one, W equals to minus P delta of V. So, this is what is called a pressure volume work. That means there is a negative external pressure which is applied on the system and which happens with the change of volume. Here you can see P is actually the external pressure which occurs on the system and delta V obviously is the change of volume and this is what is called pressure volume work. Uh, this is important, this is very central in terms of our understanding. Now, if I take a bucket, say for example, a system, let us imagine this to be a system and say for example, this is the system uh, which gives out the heat, which gives off the heat or work and here we can see that the energy level is going down. On the other hand, if the energy here, you can see that if the energy is being added, that by adding heat on a system work done is there, then the energy obviously increases. So this is something we need to understand. This is very central. So system gives off the heat or does work. The energy decreases. The system is being added with more heat. It, uh, the energy increases. But there is a small thing very important and very interesting that we need to also, you need to notice is that this one. You know, we know that U, that is the internal energy, is basically the sum of all the kinetic energies and all the potential energies. So from here, what we can see is that the first law of thermodynamics is delta U equals to Q minus W. Now, if I take a system like this, and if the heat is going out from the system, then obviously the energy is going down. But also there is something which we call the surroundings. This happens because the energy is being transferred from the system to the surrounding. Because the energy is from the system, it is going to the surrounding, which is absorbing it. So the energy level, that is why we call we call it, it goes down. And if I take a system which happens exactly as this, that means the system is being added with a specific amount of heat, a lot of energy, etc. Then the uh, it goes up. Why? Because of this, because the energy is being transferred from the surrounding to the system. So here it is from the system to the surroundings and here it is happening from the surroundings to the system. 
So that covers our first law, the zeroth law. The two laws of thermodynamics are being done. Now we come to the central and a very important law that is called the second law of thermodynamics coming up in the next part of our video. So the second law of thermodynamics, as you can see, actually establishes the concept of entropy, which is very central. And it is a physical property of thermodynamic system. So it tells that, that as an isolated system will always increase over time. So the second law states that, an that the no changes in entropy of the universe can ever be negative. So the second law is basically an uh, empirical uh, observation which was later turned by such statistical mechanics. But anyway, this is first it was based on empirical observation. Uh, here you can see that the second law of thermodynamics establishes the concept of entropy as a physical property of a thermodynamic system. Uh, what it does, it, it predicts whether processes are forbidden despite being the requirement of conservation of energy as expressed in the first law of thermodynamics and provides the necessary criteria for, uh, I would say, spontaneous process. This is important. It predicts whether processes are forbidden despite obeying the requirements. Now, here you can see there are a few things which are noteworthy in this definition. First is that it, pred it, it is a prediction of process viability. That means it is concerned with the direction and feasibility of natural processes. While the conservation of energy, the first law, ensures that energy is conserved in a closed system, it does not provide information of the practicality or spontaneity of processes. The second law, which we are doing right now, on the other hand, addresses this by predicting whether certain processes are likely to occur or not. So, a prediction of process is in our role. Second thing is spontaneity and entropy. So it is closely linked to the concept of entropy. It explains that natural processes, disorder, tends to move towards the state of higher entropy. That means randomness, disorder. This is why the statement uh, mentions that a process may be forbidden despite the conservation of energy. Even if a process does not violate energy conservation, it may involve a decrease in entropy, which actually uh, is the second law. Uh, suggests it is unlikely without external influences. So, there is a spontaneous response, there is a spontaneity. Third, which comes from the uh, our definition is thermodynamic realism. So, it provides a sense of thermodynamic realism, mean, meaning that it is guiding our understanding of the behavior of a physical system in the real world. It helps us to determine why certain processes are observed while others are really observed or those which are non-existent. So, this concept of entropy, I would say as Rudolf Clausius has taken up from Sadi Kano's further theorem, uh, further, uh, you know, mathematical process is something which is this one. First is that entropy is a measure of randomness. Second is the value of entropy depends on the mass of a system. Third is that entropy can have a positive or a negative value. And according to the second law of thermodynamics can only decrease and this term was actually coined by Rudolf Clausius and n means in plus tropy means a turning. So it is a kind of a you know amalgamation of these two Greek words. So the most important thing is that how you see Rudolf Clausius and Lord Kelvin as we see that they have taken up Sadikano's initial definition and how it had gone further forward. Now, apart from Cla Rudolf Clausius, there were a few more important people who were also involved in uh, making the second law more instrumental is this one. Uh, Ludwig Boltzmann and Joshua Williard Gibbs, they are the first who provided the probabilistic setup uh, uh, in terms of statistical mechanics and observed the nature of the molecules, thereby confirming second law or the uh, law of entropy not as an empirical observation. Max Planck made a sufficient amount of uh, contribution in terms of entropy and then John von Neumann uh, actually generalized into quantum mechanics in a book which I don't remember the name the foundational principle of quantum mechanics or something which is a very important topic I will take up later in some part of the video is called a von Neumann entropy and Claude Shannon who actually used the term in probability theory. Now, apart from Boltzmann to Claude Shannon, who were actually the contributors who developed the second law and who were actually the people who contributed in developing the second law coming up in the next part of the video, the major contributors in developing the second law. 
Obviously, the first one is Nicolas Leonard Sadi Carnot, a French physicist who is considered to be the father of thermodynamics for his responsible for the origins of second law of thermodynamics as well as various other concepts. The current form of the second law uses entropy rather than caloric, which is Sadi Carnot described it by the law. Caloric relates to heat and Sadi Carnot came to realize that uh, some caloric is always lost in the motion of cycle, thus the thermodynamical uh, reversibility concept was proven wrong uh, and it eventually involves that the irreversibility is the result of every system involved. Well, Rudolf Clausius, we have already seen, was a German physicist, coined the term entop entropy and he told that heat generally cannot flow spontaneously from a material at a lower temperature to material of higher temperature. William Thomson, who is uh, popularly known as Lord Kelvin, formulated the Kelvin statement which states it is impossible to convert heat completely in a cyclic process. It, this means that there is no way for one to convert all the energy of a system into work without losing energy. Kelvin's statement, as you can see, highlights actually the limitation on the efficiency of heat engines, suggesting that there will always be some heat loss in the conversion process and it is close related to the uh, concept of Carnot efficiency. Now, apart from these people, there is also another very important person who is this, Constantin Carothéodor. Now, Constantin Carothéodor uh, was basically a Greek uh, physicist who made a very important contribution. Now, uh, what is stated is this one. Now, the statement says that there are always states in the neighborhood of any given state that cannot be approached arbitrarily close through adiabatic changes of state. Now, what do we mean by the term adiabatic? Adiabatic process something means uh, which is which are, where no heat is transferred and it's coming from the Greek word adiabatas or impassable and it actually means that the total energy of the system remains constant. <laughs> Now, what he said, I would like to, you know, explain it in a kind of a uh, schematic diagram. So, if this is an adiabatic process and these are the surroundings, what he says is that there is always states that are more disordered than the given state and that it is impossible to reach these states from the adiabatic process. So, you can see the arrow pointing this way. So, of, uh, that means that there are certain states, there are always states that are more disordered than a given state. And hence, it won't be able to reach this stage through the adiabatic process. Now, this statement is actually equivalent to a more traditional statement of the second law of thermodynamic, which says that the entropy always increases in an isolated system. The equivalence of these statements, okay, so we will see, yeah. So, there are always more disordered than the given state, and it, uh, it is impossible to reach these states. So, from here, from all those Lord Kelvin's statement, from Carnot's statement, we, we learnt it from uh, Clausius' statement, finally, we can arrive at a final conclusion, so which is this one. So, if I take, uh, uh, you know, um, this statement of Cara Theodore, it is somewhat similar to the second law of thermodynamics, uh, the, um, which states that, uh, you know, it is a kind of a entropy always increases. But actually, the equivalence of these two statements can be shown using the concept which I have not shown, which is called a Cara Theodore function. It is a mathematical function that can be used to define entropy. But anyway, what we see from here is this one. It implies that it is impossible to build a perpetual motion machine. Also, it says that the Carathéoda statement shows that all systems will eventually reach equilibrium if they are isolated. Also, it tells that it is actually put into a lot of use using power plants, refrigerator, air conditioners and behavior of matters. Now, this second law, which states about the entropy, we can also take it forward in a very nice diagram and we can finalize it as so. The second law actually was an empirical finding that was accepted as an axiomatic theory. Now, you can see that statistical mechanics, when, when they try to provide the microscopic explanation, actually, you know, uh, in terms of probability uh, of the states, largely assembles of atoms or molecules. So, if I take a first law, which is a cup and this cup is broken. So, from this one to this one it allows and also it allows that the broken cup can be bring up into the original cup of tea. So, this is also allowed. But however, the second law, the first law, the second law allows from here to here but does not allow for the broken 
part to be assembled into the real part. So what we say from here is this, that the second law left to spontaneous evolution, that means something which will evolve, cannot decrease. And that is why, as they always tend towards the state of thermodynamic equilibrium, this program, this uh, illustration is something very interesting, which is called an arrow of time. Somehow, this would require a totally different video and we will look up uh, maybe in the net later part. So, this is actually the second law, how illustratively it can be described. Now, concept is that, is there a mathematical formulation through equations which becomes much easier to understand of the second law? Let us look in the next part of our video. What is the mathematical formulation of the second law? Obviously, the concept of entropy will come. But before we go ahead with entropy, there are two things we have to take in mind. First is that, are we considering the entropy changes of the surroundings or of the system? Obviously, we have to take both of them. So, entropy changes of the surroundings is given by this. The SURR is the surrounding. Q is the amount of heat and T is the temperature. And it also goes same for the system. So, here you can see that Q is the amount of heat exchanged, delta S is the entropy change and T is the temperature. Adding both of them together gives us this beautiful uh, you know, equation. That is, for a universe, delta S system plus delta S surrounding would be this one. Now, this is actually the, I would say, mathematical equation of the uh, thermodynamical law of the second law. But what is more important, what I would like to suggest is that, this is also applicable for two systems. As we have just seen earlier, there is a reversible and a non-reversible system. So, if we take a reversible process, that, that means, what do we mean by reversible process? Right on your screen, you can see, that means the heat loss by the system equals by the heat gained. Similarly, the heat gained by the system will be equal to the heat loss by the surroundings. So, this one is the equation. And from here, what we get is this it obviously will be equal to zero. So, what we say is that for a reversible isothermal process, the entropy change of the universe is actually zero. But remember, this is just and just applicable for a reversible process. What about an irreversible process? For an irreversible process, that means that if uh, then the heat absorbed by the system from the surrounding is given by this equation. Okay, this might look a little bit of a problem, you know, a kind of a problem, but don't worry, I will just explain it. This N are the number of moles. This R is the universal gas constant. T is the temperature. Ln is the logarithm. V2 is the final volume and V1 is the initial volume of the system. So, here we are actually assuming that the system is in ideal gas. Actually, it is an ideal gas that expands upon absorbing heat. But if it would, it would not have been ideal gas, the equation would have been further complex. So anyway, to just to understand that this is an ideal gas that expands upon absorbing heat. So the entropy of the universe uh, would be this one, where I would take the nRT logarithm of V2 by V1 whole divided by T. And from here, since we know that V2, uh, okay, so let us go back. What was the V2, the final volume? Obviously, the final volume would be greater than the initial volume and the entropy of the universe is greater than zero. So, combining, if we combine both the processes, we get into something like this. This is the equation. And this one is actually a zero for a reversible process and increases, we have seen for an irreversible process. So, what we can finalize from here is that the second law of thermodynamics leads us to conclude that disorder in the universe is increasing over time. Let us see quickly in a very clear and a very easy diagram the second law, uh, the increase in entropy, yes, is there may be work done by the system. Okay, so here is a clean diagram. So if I'm moving a uh, substance from a hot to a cold, so delta Q would be the heat transfer, and this is the formula of the entropy. We have covered the zeroth law, the first and the second, and now we come to something which is called the third law of thermodynamics. Let us look in the next part of the video. What is called the third law of thermodynamics? Now, third law of thermodynamics, it tells is something very interesting. It tells that as the temperature of a perfect crystal approaches absolute zero, the entropy of the crystal also approaches a minimum value, almost zero. Now, why it is crystal, why we are taking that, we will come to that part later. I will explain it. But before that, you see, uh, first thing is that it addresses the behavior of matter at extremely low temperatures. 
that means it provides insights into the behavior of matter as it approaches absolute zero temperature which is essential in fields uh, like cryogenics and low temperature physics also the law is often referred to as nernst heat theorem which we are going to look into so the entropy as we understand of a closed system at a thermodynamic equilibrium approaches a constant value and what is important is that this constant value does not depend on any param param parameters and an absolute zero that is zero kelvin the system must be in a state with minimum possible energy now is the time that we have understood that uh, if we take a perfect crystal and it approaches zero then the entropy would be of a minimum value but what is important is Nernst's theorem in a very simple language i would like to explain you what is Nernst's theorem coming up in the next part of the video so the Nernst theorem and the third law is almost closely related to each other so it tells that as absolute zero is approached the entropy change for a chemical or physical transformation approaches zero so here it is limit of t approaching zero and the delta is that is the change in entropy uh, entropy is zero so here is another way of writing as the temperature of a perfect crystal approaches absolute zero the entropy also gets a minimum value now this Nernst theorem actually and the third law of thermodynamics is related in the context of the behavior of matter at absolute zero temperature that means at absolute zero temperature the behavior is almost the same so this law implies that at absolute zero temperature the entropy of a perfectly ordered crystal is precisely zero that means that it makes it possible to calculate the absolute entropy of substance at any other temperature this is an important implication now what is more important is that who is walter nurst now walter nurst actually was instrumental the pioneer the first person who con who actually formed the first solve conference remember the first solve conference was important which brought quantum mechanics right on the table to discuss i have already made a very lengthy and a detailed video on how solve conferences who was ernst solve and how walter nurst actually formed the solve conferences the first solve conferences it is there on my channel physics for students you can go ahead and watch it so what do we see with the development of statistical mechanics the third law of thermodynamics like other laws change from a fundamental law uh, which is empirical we can say but uh, and it uh, fundamental law and it changed to something which is called a derived law that is derived even more from basic laws the basic law from which uh, it is primarily derived is the statistical mechanical de definition of an entropy of a large system and we are going to see what actually this is all about so this s is basically the entropy of a system the s sub zero is arbitrarily we are taking uh, at random the reference entropy kb is obviously the boltzmann constant ln is the natural logarithm and this one we are going to explore that is omega that is the number of microstates that correspond to the macroscopic system now in this video in this part from this equation what we can understand is that the entropy of a system at absolute zero is equal to the natural logarithm of the number of ground states of the system multiplied by the Boltzmann constant. I mean to say, if I ignore the mathematical equation and take a very simple equation. So that is how the third law states. Now, there are two important concepts which is reflecting on the definition. One is what is a ground state and what are microstates. First, let us explore what is a ground state coming up in the next part of the video. What is a ground state? Now, actually, in the context of the third law of thermodynamics, the ground state actually refers to the lowest possible energy state that a physical system, for example, a quantum mechanical system, etc., can attain. So, the, it represents the minimum energy and maximum stability. So, at absolute zero, I would say the system is typically in its ground state and its entropy is considered to be at a minimum. So, lowest possible energy state such as a crystal or quantum mechanical system that means the system is as ordered and stable as it can be that means it is at the maximum state it is ordered and it is stable now here you can see it is a kind of a diagram which tells that at a low temperature the crystals are quite ordered and high temperatures they are jiggling so perfect crystal or a physical system cools down to absolute zero now this is particularly important in quantum mechanics because 
the thing is that uh, the concept of ground state is relevant in quantum mechanics where it refers to the lowest energy that an atom, molecule or quantum system can occupy. So in the context of quantum mechanics, the ground state is associated with the lowest possible energy and is characterized by the quantum numbers that describe the system's electron configuration. And if we can get the electron configuration, we get everything. So this is what is called a ground state. Now coming up in the next part of the video, I would like to explain what is a microstate. Now you see if I take a cup, say for example a cup of coffee which is my favorite and these are the molecules then it tells that uh, it is an arrangement of a system of each system at a single instant. That means where this is the microscopic properties of the system and macroscopic properties are overall observable properties such as temperature, pressure, volume, I have just stated three, you can also consider energy. These are the properties we can measure at the macroscopic scale. So a microstate on the other hand represents a specific microscopic arrangement or configuration of the particles, atom molecules within the system. Now for example, if I consider two coins uh, each coin can be in one of the microstates, head or tails. It can be, there are therefore four possible states, right? Uh, it can be heads and heads, heads and tails, tails and heads, and tails and tails. Now, if I consider the macrostate of the system in which both coins are head, then this microstate can be realized by two microstates, heads and heads, and tails and heads. Therefore, I can say that the omega, that is the microstate, is just two. So, in general, understand that the omega for a macrostate is equal to the number of ways actually which can be realized by a microstate. So, for a very large number, for example, for a 100 glass molecules, it can be 10 to the power 100 or something like that. So, if we take ahead this equation, then this omega actually tells that it can be very large even for relatively simple system. The more microstate, the correspond to a macrostate, the more disordered the system is and also this omega tells a lot of things first it tells that is the number of microstates compatible with the macro your system is in for, so, and also for a macrostate at absolute zero is equal to the number of ground states and from here we can easily calculate the number of microstates compatible with energy this gives the volume of the sum of all macrostates in phase space. That means we will approximately give the volume of the equilibrium macrostate since all the contribution rest of them will be negligible. And here is the most important thing. This is why we calculate the thermodynamical entropy from a statistical mechanic because the size of the equilibrium macrostate in the phase space. So from here what we can get is this one which is very important. This is a diagram of a perfect um, a crystal. Now we know that uh, the uh, I would say for, uh, for Nernst theorem is zero provided the ground state is unique. That means if I take the omega, if the system is composed of 1 billion atoms alike, they are taking omega to be 1. So we from here what we get is this. And because of logarithm of 1 is zero, so, so the dif difference is zero as you can see. And the initial entropy can be selected value uh, as long as there are other calculations. And from there we get S equals to zero. So what it shows is thus the entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero is zero. It's a kind of a calculation which you can check it up. Now the question is that we have all taken that the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero. We know that the logarithm of one equals to zero. So we substitute the zero and we got S equals to zero. The, the question is that why we are taking it as a perfect crystal? Why not an iron or a, any other mica or any other substance? Why we are taking up crystal? Let us look in the next part of the video. What is perfect crystal and why do we use this as an example? Now you see perfect crystal, I would say it's very easy. It, it, is, it is an array or an arrangement of atoms which has got no defect. It is idealized condition. So generally in all crystals there are defects like some atoms are missing etc. But here there are no defects. So as the temperature of a perfect crystal approaches absolute zero, the entropy of the crystal approaches a minimum value often considered to be zero. From this definition, we get three important conclusions. One is that perfect crystals refers to an idealized concept where the atoms are arranged in highly high order. 
temperature approaches absolute zero signifies that as the temperature decreases the entropy of the perfect crystal also decreases and entropy approaches a minimum value suggests that at absolute zero the entropy of the crystal reaches its lowest possible value often considered to be zero now why we consider them to be perfect crystal number one a perfect crystal has got highly ordered structure that means uh, in terms of discussing or you know taking as an example a perfectly highly structured order is very important it helps us uh, things make easy it is an idealized model while no real world crystal is entirely perfect the concept of perfect crystal is an idealization in thermodynamics it has also got a well defined lattice that means the lattice structure provides simple calculations for the model that we are examining at a much lower temperature also what it provides is this one consistency with the third law because we have seen that highly ordered structure of crystal is consistent that means as the system becomes increasingly ordered and stable at lower temperatures we also have seen that it has got insights into phase transition that means the behavior of crystals at very low temperature actually gives us phase transitions such as superfluid or bose einstein condensate as the temperature decreases so this is the reason that we have using perfect crystal as an example what is a perfect crystal and how omega reduces to zero and it shows that the entropy is zero so that's all for today's video we have learned a lot of topics here is a quick summary we learned what is a thermodynamics we saw the evolution uh, from sadi kano to the zeroth law what is thermodynamic equilibrium the zeroth first second and the third law we also saw the major contributors who developed the second law the form mathematical formulations the nernst state theorem what are ground states and what are microstates and why we use perfect crystal and the definition of perfect crystal so that's all for today's video i really thank you for taking your time for watching this video if you have liked it please click on the subscribe button and click on the bell icon to get all the notification from physics for students this is my email id and this is my other uh, you know channel where i put up exclusive videos on general theory of relativity you can follow me on my facebook linkedin instagram and twitter account however thermodynamics is just as huge as an ocean and it has got many other con concepts which i am planning to cover one by one in the next part of the video but till then goodbye